Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I want to thank you from Trace Security for taking time out of your busy days. I know the transition from working in the office to remote's probably been really busy and really hectic for everyone, so we really appreciate you joining the webinar today. Uh, I'd like to apologize for any confusion that we created with the webinar link and, and timing that we sent out today. We had a few issues getting the meeting invites sent out and the time on it was incorrect. I think it was set to 12.30 instead of 1 by accident. So we're going to reach out to each and every one of you after the webinar regarding these issues. Uh, but just wanted to say thank you for being patient with us and uh, you know not having everyone in the office at one time can be a challenge. I'm sure everyone can relate to that. Uh, today we're going to go over remote work environment security and, and some of the best practices around that. Uh, we're also go going to be answering some of the questions that were submitted from each of you and then we'll do a town hall style Q&A. Uh, this webinar format's a little different for, uh, for us, so for any of you that have attended some in the past, you know, we've typically kind of just picked a topic and then one of our analysts or uh, members here at our team present on that topic and talk about it. We wanted to cover a good bit of ground and to do that uh, needed a good bit of help, so I have a few colleagues with me We'll go through some introductions of, of them. All right, so as you can see here, uh, my name is Kevin Ivey. Uh, we also have Ross Bergeron. Hey, good afternoon, everyone. And we have Blake Safeli. Hi, good afternoon. And Jason Kirby. Good afternoon, everyone. And last, Chris Riley. Good afternoon, everyone. All right, thank you. Uh, for some of you that aren't familiar with Trace, I'll give a really quick introduction. We are a cybersecurity security company that was founded in 2004. We deliver cybersecurity services to all industries, uh, and we're currently headquartered in Baton Rouge, Louisiana, with approximately 85 employees, and by currently uh, being headquartered in Baton Rouge, I mean, we're just kind of scattered everyone everywhere. I'm sure um, with COVID, most people are working from home, so we're we're doing the same as well. So we're just kind of scattered uh, across across the the state and the country. Next up, we have the agenda. Uh, this webinar is going to be broken into three different sections. The first one is going to be some remote work best practices, uh, what you can and should be doing, and just some of the things based on our experience that we found to be a common good best practice. Uh, the next part is going to be the most frequently asked questions. These are going to be the questions that you were allowed to input in when you submitted or registered to attend this webinar. So we went through those put together a good list of the most frequently asked ones, and we're going to answer those to the best of our ability. Uh, the last, we're going to open it up to a town hall style Q&A. So throughout the webinar, uh, I think at the top right, I can't see, but at the top right, there should be a Q&A button. Uh, you can go in there, and if you, you have a question about anything that we've spoken about, or maybe some topics that we didn't touch on that you'd like us to elaborate on, you can hit that button, type it, your question in, and, and when we get to this section, we'll go through as many as we can uh, and, and answer them to the best of our ability. So with all of that aside, let's jump straight into remote work best practices. The first topic that we're going to be speaking about today is VPN best practices. And then when we talk about remote access or someone connecting to your business network from anywhere in the world, uh, VPN is usually at the top of that list. So to go over some best practices around VPNs and the configurations that you could and should be setting, I'll turn over the virtual microphone to Jason Kirby. All right, thank you very much, Kevin, for that. Um, so some of the VPN best practices that um, that we should be utilizing, of course, is user authentication is uh, the absolute best practice in order to implement. Um, some some things we might be able to do is tie in the VPN and with Active Directory, uh, it allows for less of a password for a user to remember. Um, so that way they don't have to remember the remote login password and their Active Directory once they're actually on. Um, 
another type of restriction that we can uh, implement is to restrict the time range in which users are allowed to access the uh, remote network. Uh, this may be a little bit difficult for some of our IT users, but some other users that may only need to have that typical nine to five, eight to 10, things of that nature um, type of connection, uh, we would restrict them to those times. Um, Another VPN best practice that we would recommend is to implement multi-factor authentication. Uh, multi-factor authentication is defined as something you know, something you are, something you have. Something you know is always covered by the password and something that you have is typically the second one, uh, which would be one of those two-factor authentication um, hard tokens, uh, the little RSA hard tokens that have the six digits that randomly switch every 30 seconds. Uh, there's also soft tokens, which, which could just be an application on your phone, such as the Google Authenticator app. Um, <clears throat> another type of two-factor authentication is something that you are, which is bio biometric, and of course that's very expensive to implement, so not typically something that everyone goes with. Um, so something that you know and something that you have are the, are the two typical ones that we would see. Um, <clears throat> obviously another type of uh, best practice in order to implement for VPN connections is uh, to enforce those account lockouts. Uh, one very typical type of attack that we see uh, in the um, in the hacking world is um, is brute force type type attacks uh, and having account lockouts where after three failed lock uh, three failed attempts to to log into the account uh, the, that account is restricted and, and cannot log in. Uh, Having a reset timer on that can be okay, especially in the uh, in the remote world, um, but that can also start to become known. So definitely pay attention to any sort of user event logs where there are uh, three failed login attempts. Maybe it waits 10 minutes again, and then there's three more failed attempts, especially during maybe if you have those off hour restrictions and they're happening at that, that time as well. Um, and then, of course, the other way is just to to to, enforce, uh, to force the user to call in and have their password reset or account unlocked uh, by the IT team. Um, another type of VPN best practice would be to restrict IP ranges. Um, this can include country code uh, IP ranges. Uh, of course, a lot of the uh, attacks that we typically see uh, come come out of non extraditious type uh, countries such as Russia or China. Um, another type of uh, restriction is not necessarily with uh, an IP restriction, but more of a protocol restriction or type of browser. Um, things like the Onion router, which is the browser type that you would use to access the dark web. Uh, it, it really heavily encrypts your connection type, so to disallow um, a Tor node to connect to the uh, to the remote re remote network network would also be a very good uh, practice. Um, always make sure uh, within your VPN that there is nothing that is uh, or you know for, for your remote access network that there is nothing that can be accessed without any type of authentication rules um, and ensure that a full tunnel is in place so that any gateway security is effective. Uh, and of course, then always uh, the last piece for uh, VPN, which I touched on briefly, is to monitor your VPN access. Uh, we should always be monitoring um, actively who is who is connecting, the IP address that they're connecting from, um, <clears throat> uh, what time that they connected, uh, and and hopefully any uh, also be able to monitor any resources that they're touching while they're on the remote network. Uh, so that way we can keep eyes on uh, any any data or information that they have. And I believe that should be everything that I have, Kevin. Excellent, excellent. Thank you, Jason, for that information regarding VPN best practices. Uh, I think now that we've discussed VPNs and some of the secure ways that we can configure them and what you should and shouldn't be looking for, we'll go straight into endpoint protection. Uh, these are going to be anything from laptops, workstations, tablets, things like that. Uh, I know with COVID and most employees working from home, in, including myself, it's very important to focus on those type of devices that we're using at home for work. So with that said, I'll turn over the virtual microphone to Christopher Riley so he can talk about that and some of the best practices regarding it. Awesome. Thank you very much, Kevin. So endpoint protection is uh, it's even more important for remote workforce because you don't have control of that network any longer. 
Um, the end user's network could have a router that's configured with an insecure password or even have an open or easily compromised wireless network. It could have a bunch of IoT devices, Alexas and Google Homes and stuff. There could be any number of issues on that end user network, so you don't really have that control any longer. Um, of course, there's still a whole bunch of things that you can do to strengthen the security posture of these remote machines. So I'm going to start off in, in no particular order except the first one. The first one's first because you should always know what you have. And particularly whenever we're talking about remote stuff, you should always know what you have outside your walls. You should have an inventory of all these remote assets. You should, you should have a, a, a listing of all the services that are exposed through your firewall to the internet. Um, some questions you can ask yourself about these services to kind of identify their individual security posture is who can access it. If it's accessible from a certain range of IP addresses, not that big of an issue. If it's accessible to the world, bigger issue. Um, how does the authentication work? If it's a bunch of local accounts and we're not paying attention to it, that's 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 an issue. We should we should address that. Um, is there multi-factor authentication? That's a big one, especially for any services exposed to the to the internet as a whole. Uh, credential stuffing, brute force attacks, password sprays, they happen. And if someone gets a gets a positive hit, but there's multi-factor authentication, you've been protected by that multi-factor authentication. Um, so that's just inventory. It's something you should definitely have. Um, moving on to more endpoint specific security set setups. Um, the biggest one I think is going to be full disk encryption. Um, any system that is outside your walls or can walk out that door should be protected with full disk encryption. Um, the reason it's so good is the operating system itself is protected via uh, encryption keys. And if you don't have that key, you can't actually access the underlying file system. Um, why full disk encryption instead of a file level encryption like EFS? Well, if the file level encryption is used, then those files themselves are protected, but the operating system is not. And if the operating system is not protected, then anytime if that, if that device is lost or, or stolen, everything on that system can be considered compromised except those files. And what's on that system is passwords. Uh, you can extract passwords from that system for their Windows login, any Chrome passwords, if they have password managers, all of that can be extracted in, in plain text. So then you can immediately consider that, that end user's account compromised unless that system was protected with a full disk encryption. Uh, full disk encryption can help to kind of mitigate that mantra that uh, without physical security, there is no security because if you can't access the file system, you can't access the computer. Host based firewalls. That's kind of my next point. My next point on here. Um, host host based firewalls are important since you don't control that network. You don't know what's on it. And the best thing you can do is to configure that network as a public network. Uh, by default, Windows does not allow any port access from, from any public network. So if there are no ports and services exposed, a system can't be compromised from outside. Patching, it is absolutely imperative that systems are still being patched. They may not be able to access your WSUS server, or, or maybe your bandwidth is just not enough to be sending patches over the VPN to the client. And ensure that they're still getting patches, even if you have to route the downloads right back to Microsoft. Patches are super important, particularly when you don't know what could be on that, that other end user's network. Um, in a similar vein, um, endpoint protection. It's imperative that endpoint protection is still being patched, still being managed and monitored. Um, if, if an end user gets, a, gets an infection, you should still know that that happens. It, it, it's important that their endpoint protection is still communicating with your service. Um, don't give your users local administrative access. Um, they don't need it. They really don't. They don't need to be installing software. And if they own the device and you're doing some sort of BYOD, it's, it's best if you can give them something to log into on your end that you can monitor and control. For example, using um, a virtual desktop or a remote desktop once they're logged in. Some, some setup that they're using primarily that you're monitoring and you're controlling. Um, similar removable media, um, you still don't need flash drives. 
you don't it, it's 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 a matter of data egress it's a matter of malware ingress it's just not good and similarly if it's their device try to give them something that they can remote into and use that you control um you should require that your end users work from home from a non-public internet connection working from starbucks may be fun but it is not safe uh, wireless is not secure and anyone who's on that network can decrypt all of the traffic that isn't uh, further encrypted through an SSL or a TLS connection. Um, you're on the same broadcast network as these people, so you could potentially get in the middle of all of this communication. So anything that's slightly insecure is even further, uh, is made even more insecure by the fact that you're on a, an open Wi-Fi network. Um, and then endpoint monitoring. Endpoint monitoring is something a lot of people aren't doing, but it is imperative that you monitor these endpoints. Since they're not within your walls anymore, you don't have that um, security through your edge. They're, they're outside of your edge at this point. So you need to be monitoring your, your endpoints. You need to be alerting your endpoints because logs do absolutely nothing if you're not paying attention to these systems. And once again, if it's their device, try to give them something that you control that they can use primarily. So they're not primarily using their own laptop. Um, and finally, kind of something about availability, a little less about security. Um, if they're working on these laptops, you need to be backing up any of that data. Um, if they spend a whole lot of time generating something and their machine dies and you lose it, that's a, that's a big deal. And all you really need to do is establish some sort of endpoint backup solution. Uh, Windows backup works great and over a VPN tunnel. If, if it's just the files, it's not that bad. And that is everything I had on endpoint security. But feel free to throw up any questions that you have in the chat and we'll address them at the end. Absolutely. Thanks, thanks, Chris, for the information. I, I think it kind of went over some full disk encryption using host based firewalls, uh, making sure that all of your systems and workstations, servers, or patched. So the best way to do that would be to have some type of patch management solution so it's not such a tedious task. Um, also not not providing local administrative access, restricting media usage, uh, not connecting to non-public networks is probably not a good idea if, if you're doing some actual work and have some sensitive information to stop at a Starbucks, sit there uh, and, get, and begin working on that public network. It, it is insecure. Great information, Chris. Uh, moving forward, we will now jump to social engineering. I know that most of us are familiar with social engineering because it can be anything from an email campaign to the annoying fake phone calls uh, that that you you know you want a free iPad. Uh, they've kind of migrated now to SMS mess messages, which is called smishing and so on. So it uh, it's a very tricky but effective attack in today's world, and especially with COVID and, and most people working from home and not being, you know, within the borders or, or the protection measures that you have put together as an organization. It's, it, it's a much more successful attack. I do know that a, a real current example is with uh, the stimulus checks that, that were getting sent out to everyone that, that a lot of campaigns have been kind of created or curated around that. Uh, so you may get an email that says, hey, here's your stimulus check. All you have to do is click the button uh, and you can get your 15,000 bucks. All you have to do is put all of your life and your family's information in real quick. Uh, so that's social engineering. Uh, I'll go ahead and hand this over to Ross Bergeron so he can tell us a little bit more about social engineering and why the topic is much more important, especially during these times. Thank you so much. Uh, hey everyone, and as Kevin said before, uh, social engineering is a topic that many of you may uh, already be familiar with and uh, even have communicated within your internal security awareness training or in some sort of testing exercises. Um, but essentially, social engineering in the context of information security is the psychological manipulation of people uh, in order to perform actions or uh, trying to manipulate them into performing actions or divulging confidential information. Uh, there are various methods that bad actors will attempt to bamboozle remote workers, including but not limited to malicious emails uh, and phone calls, 
uh, as well as the text messaging or, or the SMS smishing that uh, Kevin was referring to, uh, and even using public websites. Uh, in consideration of the pandemic and the new normal of the remote workforce, threats of social engineering across all communication channels have increased as attackers seek to take advantage of the technical and social changes during this time. Malicious parties are striking hard and fast to manipulate or confuse solitary staff members in the midst of their changing work environment. So in a recent three month study by a major network security provider, a trend analysis of anonymized web and traffic was uh, observed and considerable spikes in activity related to URLs and embedded links using the keywords COVID and Corona were found. Uh, the increase in spam emails alone using these keywords were logged in at around half a million per day across this data set alone. And keep in mind that was only from one security provider. There are many more. Um, attackers are very swift and crafty. And for example, uh, let's say a bad actor could send an email posing as a telecom vendor. The message uh, providing a malicious Zoom link or even a file download could be used to take advantage of this now highly used remote technology that some employees are not fully accustomed to. As such, Email security filtering is a good first line of defense for, for corporate email accounts. Um, additionally, social engineering and phishing exercises, along with strong and clear email policies, uh, which include guidance for recognizing these types of uh, spam emails uh, and reporting these malicious emails should be instituted by your organization. Also, guidance should be established for properly validating any kind of client or vendor meeting sessions before accepting any of these new remote sessions. So some sort of an internal process to uh, verify those. There are also increasing numbers of new web domains that have been registered associated to the keywords COVID and Corona and browsing activity for these uh, websites relating to the pandemic have skyrocketed since major city lockdowns have been put into place. This could be a potential hotbed for malicious websites that could be hidden amongst legitimate sites. Uh, basically, uh, they've been created by people to exploit the concerns of the masses and hoping that people will rush in or those malicious links could even lead to there. Uh, remote workers should be attentive to the sites that they visit, uh, seeking pandemic related information, ensuring that this, it is sourced from a trusted government or entity's website. Uh, additional technical security controls could potentially be utilized with URL filtering depending on the type of VPN setup that you guys have, uh, but safe browsing practices and communication are always uh, at the top of that list. Taking it a step further, many employees are now being issued corporate devices and potentially granted VPN access to internal network resources. Another vulnerability of social engineering within the remote environment are attacks from employee personal email or social network accounts. Unlike corporate accounts, personal emails are not equipped with advanced security monitoring and protection capabilities. This could cause a flood of these fan messages and seemingly authentic emails uh, with convincing content to, to rush into the personal email accounts, such as these uh, spoofed information from the World Health Organization or erroneous relief offerings uh, for struggling families like Kevin mentioned earlier. Uh, the same could be said for social media, such as Facebook. Many social media posts within different groups and pages are spanned with illegitimate offerings from work from home opportunities, sweepstakes, giveaways, and all different manners of uh, uh, basic nefarious means that are simply phishing attempts designed to get the end user to click on a malicious link. In the event of a successful phishing attack via personal email or social media, it could still potentially extend the data breach to compromise the corporate device or the remotely connected network resources. Uh, if personal email and social media are not required for business duties, it is best practice to enforce a policy to restrict access to these applications or websites on the corporate issue devices, uh, perhaps with some sort of endpoint protection, uh, as mentioned in the last section. Alternately, the organization could develop a documented acceptable use policy that communicates these uh, restrictions to remote workers very clearly. And lastly, uh, phone and SMS text messaging based fish attempts uh, or smishing are still very prevalent. Uh, pre prevalent. Uh, a few examples are the mini robo dialers with automated recordings. Uh, uh, my favorite one is actually not available anymore. It used to be a cruise ship and you can actually hear it honking its horn and leaving the harbor in the background. Uh, there's also scam artists that call posing as impacted businesses seeking information. Uh, spam text messages have been dispatched by the thousands to uh, uh, mobile devices around the world. 
Uh, employees should be diligent as ever in communicating over the phone as to adhere their organization's privacy policies and to follow the correct protocol to escalate requests for information or services. As with corporate issued laptops, an email or text mess message phishing attack could potentially breach mobile devices or connected resources to that mobile device. A uh, company should ensure that security training and end user policies clearly communicate the potential threat of uh, SMS text messaging, uh, social engineering via voice lines, and even email phishing threats issue, uh, to issue mobile devices. Uh, thank you, everyone. I appreciate your time. Yeah, thanks a lot, Ross. Uh, social engineering is always a really interesting topic because it's been around for so many years. Uh, it, it has just taken many different forms over the over those years. It's kind of evolved into a, a very robust attack. Uh, but I know at some point we we've all received that personal email from a uh, I guess a prince in Nigeria that was just he just inherited you know 50 billion bucks and for some odd reason he decided to reach out to you and he's going to trust you to store all of that in your bank account and not store and, and not spend it on Starbucks um, shopping and whatever else we do Amazon things like that uh, it's been around it's a tricky kind of funny topic at times uh, but it is very effective and it and, and successful so you should always be equipped with the knowledge and the information regarding social engineering and then of course train and test employees to the best of your ability all right moving on to the last topic which is end user security we've we've discussed vpns and bridging the home network to the business network uh, we've discussed endpoint devices and what we should be doing at a minimum and kind of some things to look at and then of course recently we just discussed social engineering attacks and some of the best practices around them now i'll go ahead and hand over the stage to blake Safeli, so we can talk about the things that your employees or your end users could be doing to better secure your data and their home networks as well. Blake. All right. Uh, thank you, Kevin. So yes, for our last topic of the webinar, we'll be taking a look at uh, end user security and discussing some steps for securing their home networks as well as some administrative uh, controls related to remote working. Now, um, recall earlier, uh, Chris briefly mentioned some areas around you know, securing routers. So you know, how should employees secure their home networks? Well, firstly, by changing those default router login credentials. So no admin blank, admin password, admin admin, and instead using a strong complex password uh, for that router's administrative account to log into it. One that adheres to uh, organization password policy requirements and nothing like spring 2020, password one, welcome one, um, something like that that could be easily guessed uh, by an attacker trying to breach the, the router in the network. Um, next, ensuring that the router itself is updated with the latest patches, the latest firmwares. Um, if it's a very outdated piece of equipment, um, working with those employees to replace it you know, if applicable and if budget allows. Uh, next, enabling the network firewall on the router to provide for an additional layer of protection uh, for traffic coming in and going out. Uh, then configuring WPA2 or WPA3 uh, with a PSK, so that way they can provide for encryption and authentication. So it's not just like we discussed earlier, an open wireless network like Starbucks or something like that, where anyone could connect in and try to monitor traffic. Um, and again, that PSK you know, password that they're configuring on the router, um, ensuring that it is adhering to organization password policy requirements as well. And then lastly, uh, another common practice is disabling Wi-Fi protected setup uh, just because it allows for much quicker brute forcing um, of those connection pins in order to authenticate to the network. It's not as secure um, as doing something like that secure PSK or password that we configured. Um, and then lastly, they're uh, disabling universal plug and play uh, because that protocol can allow for malware that um, is on a personal device, so a laptop, to automatically go in and modify router settings and permit direct connections from the public internet back into the public device, uh, the personal device. All right, and then now for some of the administrative related controls. So firstly, looking at policies and procedures. So we just discussed you know, several hardening steps 
uh, do we have all that documented? Is there a formal procedure or checklist uh, that we're providing to employees rather than some type of verbal communication? You know, a quick checklist they can look at and follow exactly what they're supposed to do as far as ensuring that their home network is further secured. And I know we mentioned, you know, organization password policy requirements a couple of times. Do we actually have that documentation? Uh, do those requirements exist? Uh, do we have an acceptable use policy uh, documented as well? And in the case of issue devices, uh, laptops, smartphones, uh, tablets, do we have a mobile device policy or some type of device agreement uh, that's documented in place? And then if applicable, do we have a BYOD policy documented? So, you know, firstly, we need to ensure that you know, any of these items are applicable to our environment. You know, if we have issued, if we have BYOD, um, that we have those requirements uh, documented, we have that documentation in place and any security stipulations, requirements that we want uh, our employees to meet and achieve, that that is included within that respect to documentation. And then lastly, that they are all signed and agreed to uh, by the employees, you know, documenting their acknowledgement and acceptance uh, for compliance. And then lastly here, taking a look at, you know, now that we have our documentation defined, we need to ensure appropriate training for our employees. Uh, earlier, you know, Kevin and Ross both mentioned a variety of social engineering attack vectors uh, to help mitigate this risk. We commonly think of you know, security awareness training, uh, make sure we're providing that to employees, uh, but make sure that it's not just broad sort of general training, but more specific to even, you know, remote working. Uh, practices that we you know, have inclusion for phishing, phishing, smishing, something that they may be facing now on an everyday basis, you know, trying to breach their account. But, you know, it is much more targeted uh, than just that general set of security awareness training we think for a general compliance perspective annually. Um, next, ensuring that policy training uh, is in place. So we have that password policy, acceptable use, mobile device, BOD documentation we have in place. Uh, that we are having actual training on those policies. Um, we've reviewed it with the employees. They know what it is. They know what their compliance requirements are. You know, ensuring that there is ongoing regular training, reminder training, uh, communication sent to them uh, regarding those policy requirements. And then in closing, uh, providing for you know that home network security we discussed before. We have that procedure, that documentation. Uh, that we are providing training regarding what those procedure or, or checklist documentation requirements are. Uh, because, you know, even though we verbally discussed it with them, we've given them this checklist, you know, now we need to provide that training to them to help further solidify their understanding of, you know, what those requirements are, uh, what the purpose, you know, is behind that checklist, you know, how it's helping them to be secure, um, and ultimately the organization remains secure. And then addressing any questions that may likely arise from your non-technical employees. They may have never tried to connect to the router and, and change passwords and edit and modify settings. So, you know, there may have to be more than just a general uh, training set for employees across the board. There may have to be some even one-on-one -on -one sessions, you know, established with some of those employees to make sure that they understand. Absolutely. Thank you very much, Blake, for that information. Uh, we're going to move forward now to the most frequently asked questions. Uh, I think each of you, as part of the sign up to attend this webinar, there was an optional question uh, that you could submit. We went through and reviewed those and pulled the most frequently asked ones. <clears throat> So we will start at the top. Uh, first question is, what are the risks associated with using applications like TeamViewer or GoToMyPC for remote access? And will these applications shield the corporate network from unauthorized access? Okay, so this is Chris here. Um, I'll take this one. Um, the risks are essentially identical when it comes to endpoint security um to the to the remote machine on the other side and 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 the reason being is if i've compromised your system I, I can do whatever you can do and if you can log into your system within the corporate network through team viewer go to my pc uh citrix zen desktop vmware horizon if you however you have that remote virtual machine or physical machine set up 
I, as the attacker, would be able to do the same. Um, with key loggers or anything like that, I would know that person's password. I could access that service as that user. That being said, um, if there's multi-factor authentication through some sort of SMS code or one-time password through email, I may not have access to that, but it's safe to say I could probably get access to that if I knew the, the user's phone number, I could pretend to be them to their phone company and do a little SIM swap or something like that. Those aren't 100% uh, foolproof, but um, it is definitely a, a, a hurdle that someone would have to overcome in order to gain access. So are they great solutions? Not by any means. Um, will they work? Sure, I guess. Back to you, Kev. Absolutely. Thank you very much for the answer. Uh, the next question is, what are some best practices for BYOD for VPN use? All right. So, uh, frankly speaking, uh, BYOD is not something that's typically recommended for, for VPN use by employees. And in a few moments, I'll highlight some of the security and operational challenges you might face to kind of justify that reasoning. Um, now, you know, that being said, uh, some organizations may face constraints that at least warrant consideration and even use uh, of BYOD uh, for that VPN. Now, um, say, for instance, you have resource constraints. You just simply don't have enough laptops on hand to issue to all the employees that now have to go and work from home. Uh, you may have budget related constraints. There's not enough capital to buy the additional ones that you do need. Um, they could be time based that you just can't purchase. Even if you have the budget, you can't purchase them all, get them configured and issued to all the employees uh, to maintain operations effectively um, or even vendor constraints. So you may, you may have the time, the budget and everything else, but Dell, Lenovo, whoever your vendor is, they may not be able to supply um, and fill uh, that large order on such short notice, especially when you know, many other organizations are having similar requests, you know, coming into them all at the same time. So, you know, when your back is essentially against that wall, uh, you need to stay in business. Your only option is to do the uh, BYOD. Uh, firstly, we can establish some similar guidelines and procedures as we discussed during that securing home networks portion earlier. Uh, we can provide those to employees to kind of have that procedure checklist to help them ensure security over that personal device, such as, you know, uh, those common areas we discussed in endpoint security uh, with Chris earlier, installing and configuring antivirus, you know, enabling host-based firewalls, ensuring that the laptop is fully patched and up to date, um, helping them to configure a secure web browser, so having the pop-up blocker turned on, the ad blocker, um, et cetera. So there are some practices uh, that you can put in place to help them further secure, you know, uh, ensure that the device can remain protected. Um, so it is, you know, possible to help them uh, to do that for use over VPN. Uh, but recall, you know, I mentioned earlier some challenges, uh, and I want you to consider uh, these following administrative nightmares <laughs> uh, you may face if you decide to go with an option of, of BYOD. Uh, the firstly being, you know, you, you would have a variety of operating systems in use. You know, you would see anything from Windows XP, you know, end of way past end of life devices uh, that some employees, you know, may have uh, Windows 7, Windows 10, even Mac OS. Uh, and then next, you know, you would have inconsistent patching across the board. You know, you don't have that automated software patch management tool uh, that's deployed for all the endpoints. You know, now it's it's end user managed entirely. Uh, so some they may be patching up to date and have no issues. Some may have legacy operating systems like that XP machine. Uh, some may not patch for months. Some may not patch for years. Um, and then, you know, like we talked about the antivirus, there's inconsistent security tool deployment across the endpoint. So, you know, while some users may have antivirus installed already, others may not. So now you have to look towards do we need to purchase, you know, some type of antivirus product uh, for all those employees for their BYOD devices. and you know, even if we do, uh, some of those employee systems may already be compromised before any of this begins. They may have had a rootkit, you know, for the past two years and a keylog or something to that effect. So that's another area you have to think about and evaluate. Um, you lose control over the web content that they're accessing. Now, they may be doing uh, some organization related work on their personal device now, but they may also be browsing you know, malicious websites or infected websites um, in their free time, and you would have no control over that. Um, 
then you would also have no restrictions over installed software. You know, it's their device, their local administrator on it, so they can download torrent files, a variety of other software that could lead to infection uh, and potentially sensitive data exposure. So, you know, operationally, you know, we also have to evaluate how do we ensure installed applications are deployed to each respective employee's laptop and configured appropriately. You know, everything may not be necessarily cloud-based. It may be a local uh, piece of software they need installed. And, you know, what if, say, for instance, Susie, the loan officer, you know, needed an application that's only compatible with Windows 8 and Windows 10, but she has a MacBook. So, you know, how do we go about addressing those types of challenges? So, you know, again, it, it's possible, you know, to use BYD over VPN, uh, but it's not something that's typically recommended unless no other option is available. And if the decision is made to pursue, you know, using those personal devices in those cases, uh, you should try to already have plans uh, documented in place uh, to assist, you know, with the hardening of their devices, just like we're doing with their home networks, with their routers. And again, providing training to them regarding this hardening, you know, what they're supposed to do, um, and then having some plans documented to ensure that operationally, you know, it's feasible for those employees in terms of you know, that business related software that they can utilize it and it can work effectively across the board. Absolutely great answer, Blake. I know it's uh, poses a big challenge and a lot of risk to an organization to, to adopt a BYOD implementation program and policy. I know specific to mobile, op mobile operating systems, a lot of people have the ability to you know, root Google Android devices or even jailbreak the iOS devices uh, that and that ultimately allows them to be the actual uh, root administrator on those devices and they can kind of manipulate and, and do what they want like that. And and that may uh, introduce some type of malware as well uh, as it, everything else that you spoke about a second ago. All right, the next question is, what is the best way to add more remote workers for minimal expense? Does anyone want to tackle this one? Um, yeah, sure, this is Jason. Um, so I think definitely the best way to uh, add more remote, or more remote workers for a minimal expense is to look at options which are going to allow you to add uh, license keys onto the product. Um, so more of a software approach rather than a hardware approach. Uh, if you come up against something where your hardware can only permit up to 100 users, for example, uh, in order to connect remotely, um, you know, then you're going to have to buy new hardware. Whereas if you purchase just the software solution from, uh, say, like a third party or something like that, then all you need to do is expand your licenses. So um, I definitely say to to evaluate whether or not we're going to bring hardware in or utilize software, which I'm sure is a common occurrence uh, in, in a lot of different organizations that are attending the call, um, uh, that that el elastic uh, um, consideration that we take into account for multiple things is going to be the same type of application or or you know how how it applies in in to, to this question absolutely and if we answer that a different way because we got the question and we weren't entirely too sure how to answer or which way it was uh framed if we're if we're ask, answering the question uh how can you add remote workers for a minimal ex expense. I think we had a discussion. Uh, was that you, Chris, about using open VPNs, uh, using open VPN and possibly some SSH jump boxes? Yeah, um, Chris here, if, if, if you wanted to do it um, on the cheap, so to say, um, you could stand up a virtual machine or a physical machine with something like PFSense or some sort of open VPN compatible firewall, and you can set up a fairly secure um, system that way. Um, this would allow uh, endpoints to identify themselves to the VPN server, the VPN server to identify itself to the endpoints through certificate authentication. So it's fairly secure and it's fairly easy to configure and it's free, which is a huge bonus. Um, you could also stand up an SSH box on, on the external side of your network, you know, forwarded through the firewall. And with port forwarding, you can allow someone to log into this box and only forward ports to their system. That way they can use remote desktop to connect to their desktop 
inside of the environment. And what this would allow you to do is they're not working on their machine. They're working on your machine inside of your organization, inside of your perimeter. And really the only thing that's left the organization is them. As long as they don't copy paste anything to the local machine, your data doesn't come down. Um, you still have to worry about the endpoint security. So that's not a panacea by any stretch of the imagination, but it is a consideration and it is also fairly inexpensive. As long as you have the hardware, if you've got some, some virtual machine space laying around somewhere, you can stand this up fairly resource inexpensive. And that's me. Back to you, Kevin. Excellent. Thanks. Thanks, Jason. And, and thanks, Chris, as well. Um, the last question that we have here before we go to the live Q&A is, does Zoom pose a real threat to users? Uh, I do know personally that Zoom has been uh, in the news pretty heavy over the past month or two since, especially since COVID happened, but it has been in the news uh, in a bad way before then. So I'll turn this over to, who wants to answer this one? Yeah, this is Ross, I'll jump on that. Yeah. All right, yeah, so as Kevin mentioned, uh, as of recently and even uh, in the recent past, uh, Zoom has been plagued with a myriad of privacy and security issues, which are currently even still being exploited worldwide. Uh, current issues range from reputation damage to eavesdropping vulnerabilities and even session intrusion, which could even lead to a potential divulgence of sensitive information uh, for, for your company. Uh, some examples of attacks are, are war dialing attacks where automated tools will continuously check for open session IDs due to weak session handling for some of the remote sessions on Zoom. Uh, th they've mentioned that they've tried to uh, revamp that and make it a little bit more secure. Uh, but there's still uh, uh, occurrences of it. Uh, from that, uh, there are occurrences uh, called Zoom bombing, in which people will actually uh, intrude on remote sessions and bombard the participants with abusive or explicit content. Uh, uh, and it's it's fairly nasty and it basically is, is not appropriate. Uh, and there's also malware-based attacks that could uh, enable session recording and capture chat text without any kind of uh, knowledge of the participants involved. Uh, currently, uh, there are major entities, uh, the US government and other governments around the world, which have banned and strongly discouraged the use of Zoom for any official communications. Uh, in fact, Zoom has been ridiculed in the past for ignoring or delaying mitigation of previous critical vulnerabilities, which did allow malicious attackers to take control of uh, Mac-based systems. Uh, it was also recently discovered that around 500,000 Zoom user account credentials are for sale on the dark web from a previous Zoom cyber attack. Uh, a fourth lawsuit, additionally, has just been filed against Zoom, and they are accused of, quote, inadequate data privacy and security measures, and also falsely asserting that their service was end-to-end -end encrypted. Uh, in fairness, the Zoom company did, does have plans to encrypt all components by May 30th of this year, and uh, password-enforced sessions could help to prevent some of the current security flaws. Um, as a security professional, however, I would not currently recommend Zoom for use in an enterprise business. Uh, personally, I, I would not even accept a Zoom meeting from any of my clients and opt for an alternate communication channel if feasible, such as a, a more secure remote conferencing application or even just telephone conferencing. Kevin. Yeah, that was, that was some great information, Ross. <clears throat> I know Zoom's been in the news a pretty good bit. Uh, that some pretty high risk vulnerabilities. So thank you for elaborating on that. Uh, the next section and the last section of the webinar is going to be a town hall style Q&A, you know, with the functionality and features of Teams. Uh, the way that we're, we're going to be able to do that is any of the questions that you submitted during the webinar, uh, we're going to kind of go through them now from, from start to finish and, and see how many we can answer. Give me one second. Let me get the question pulled up and we'll get started here. All right. The first question was, will you be providing the slide deck or a recording after meeting? Yes, we will. Uh, the webinar has been recorded. We will provide the slide deck and we will also put together some of the bullet points for each of those topics that we went over in the best practice section so you can have that as well. Let's get down. 
that w that went in line with another question, uh, which is that is there a nifty list of the talking points? Like I said, we will include those talking points uh, with the webinar recording and the PowerPoint presentation. Next question. If you have multi factor authentication, why is account lockout still recommended? OK, Chris here. I will take that one. Um, multi factor authentication um, just prevents the successful login from becoming a, a, an established session. So if I'm a, an attacker and I'm, I'm, I'm attacking and I find a positive hit, now I know I have a username and I know I have a password and they're good for your organization through credential stuffing, I can pass that to other systems and other services that you may not have multi-factor authentication to. Um, password reuse is super, super common. So um, if, you, if you don't have multi-factor on everything, it is still an issue and you would want to have that lockout to slow the brute force attack down and to let you know that it's even happening in the first place. Because if a user comes to you and says, hey, uh, my account's locked, I did not, fat finger my password the amount of times it would require to lock my my uh, account out that's an immediate indication that someone is knocking on your door um it's it's something that you could be paying attention to and you should be paying attention to and um you know with password reuse and credential stuffing you may not have all your doors secured the same way back to you kev yeah thanks for the answer chris uh, let me get through here and we'll jump on the next question. OK, next question. If remote users are assigned laptops just to remote desktop protocol to their workstations at corporate, what additional security measures do they need to deploy, if any, from what was already discussed? Would anyone like to jump on that one? Yeah, Chris here, I'll, I'll take that one as well. Um, it, it, it depends on, on, on what you mean by remote desktops to their workstations. If you mean that you forwarded remote desktop through the firewall, please don't do that. That's a terrible idea. Um, if you mean that you have allowed VPN access into a secured segment where the only thing that they can do from that segment is remote desktop into their workstation, that's great. Um, Additional implementations could be dual factor authentication. If you have some sort of MFA where they have to present a one time password to successfully remote desktop to that system, then you have secured that system from credential stuffing or password spraying. If they are successfully able to get into your VPN, um, say, for example, you don't have MFA on the VPN, but you do have MFA on the remote desktop, you didn't stop the attack at the VPN, you stopped it at the remote desktop. So. I guess that that's my thought on on that one. If there's any if there's anything I, I miss on that, guys, uh, feel free to chime in. Excellent. <clears throat> I'm going through the list here, making sure we don't miss anything. Uh, the next one, and I'll have to check to see. Do you recommend services like Cisco's Umbrella for endpoint security? Uh, I don't personally have any experience with Cisco Umbrella. Does any of you guys? Hi, this is Ross. Um, I, I don't have any personal experience with it, but I'll give you my point of view on endpoint security. Um, so uh, uh, what I would suggest right now is uh, something that's fitting for your organization. It's hard to say a specific recommended product would be right for you. Um, while a lot of the big name vendors do provide a, a lot of the functionality that you're requiring, some may provide extended functionality that you may not require or too little or may be unmanageable for your organization. Further from that, there could be uh, differences in licensing and how those are applied, which could affect the budget. So uh, as for whether or not it's a quality product, yeah, yes, Cisco makes quality products, but uh, I would say search for an endpoint security solution that's fitting for your organization based on, on what your needs are uh, and based on, on their reputation and the functionality of the specific product you're looking for. Absolutely, thank you, Ross. Let's see here. I'm going down the list as well. We did have uh, an anonymous submission that stated that they highly recommend Sophos endpoint security in case anyone wants a recommendation. So look at that. All right.
think the next one is, I'm still going through. Um, so if the VPN connection is encrypted, can the information still be captured? The information, uh, this is Jason, by the way, the information would still be captured, but it would be a garbled, jumbled mess of letters, numbers, capitals, all sorts of things to the uh, to, to the average user or packet sniffer um, application that captured it. Um, un unlike where it is in plain text, uh, if I captured whatever you were sending over in plain text, not encrypted, then I would see exactly whatever you were sending. Absolutely. Thanks, Jason. And I think the uh, one area to focus on for this question is so yes if if the connection is encry encrypted and it's captured uh, per se we we know that it can't be easily re readable but what we should focus on and, and make sure uh, is that the protocols that we, we're using for our vpn connection that they're secure that they're uh, not outdated protocols that can potentially be um, exploited or, or down the line cracked to get information into stuff like that so and then of course with the vpn connection being encrypted the next important thing would be uh, making sure that you have good authentication all right let's get to another question what is your view on using bios passwords to start a provided laptop are those hackable Does anyone want to tackle that one? Oh uh, yeah, Chris here. Um, yes, BIOS passwords are great. Um, the only issue with BIOS passwords is typically physical access negates the BIOS password entirely. So um, if you have a laptop, for instance, you could take the laptop apart, bridge some jumpers, and boom, no BIOS password. So BIOS passwords are great, but not having physical security of that device basically negates the BIOS password. Um, if it's still within your walls, great. BIOS passwords, totally recommend it. It stops me from plugging in a flash drive during a social engineering engagement, rebooting the machine to uh, a Linux ISO and having every bit of access to that uh, physical hard drive as an administrator would. So I would definitely recommend having BIOS passwords, but it, it's not particularly relevant to a remote workforce because physical security is, I don't want to say out the window, but it's no longer as relevant. Back to you, guys. Yeah, thanks for the response there. Um, going through the list, we may have one more question. Hey, uh, hey, Kev, this is Ross. Yeah. Can, I, can I add a little bit to that last one as well? Absolutely. Yeah, I just want to throw in a, a couple of different uh, uh, variants there. Uh, so he did he did mention some of the cons of the BIOS password. So yes, it, it is an additional layer of security there, and it is uh, difficult to to get through if you have a strong password unless you have that physical access. Um, I have heard of software that is able to crack in some situations BIOS passwords as well. Um, the only difficulties, and I did want to communicate this to you guys as well, as uh, as kind of mentioned, you, you have to have direct access to reset the password or if the password is reset by the user and they forget it, then it could be an issue as far as gaining access to their uh, machine itself. Uh, furthermore, um, there, there is a potential for a false sense of security if it is, say, for example, a laptop or a mobile device. That BIOS password, while it may restrict someone from gaining access to the BIOS, it is still potentially they could rip out that hard drive and try to pull the data off with some other kind of uh, device. And uh, if the data was not encrypted on that hard drive, which BIOS passwords do not provide data encryption, you could recover readable text. So uh, at that point, I would say an endpoint security solution that provides hard disk encryption uh, could provide that same password protection at the level of the BIOS, and make it a little bit more difficult to crack and centralize the management as well as putting that layer of encryption on the disk. So if the physical compromise does happen, you don't have to worry about data disclosure. And that's all I want to mention. Yeah, thanks a lot, Ross. Um, I was going through the questions. It looks like we have another. Let me get scrolled here. OK, how can we? Let's see. I'm trying to get it pulled up. OK. 
Uh, this came in from Eric. By listing guidelines for home network setups, do you run the risk of having to now also support the home networks? And does that not open up the avenue to use a company's IT team for troubleshooting the home network? Sure, uh, Eric, so I'll, I'll jump in and take this. I know I, I covered a lot of it earlier. So um, yes, you're listing those guidelines for their home network setups. Um, it could possibly, you know, increase that risk, uh, if you want to call it that, that you now have to help support them. Uh, but I mean, the opposite spectrum of that is by not providing them with any type of guidelines or requirements, um, you're opening the floodgates in essentially. So you have no idea what their home network setup might be like, you know, if it could already be compromised, it may become compromised at some point. Um, so by not providing them with that guidelines, um, you would also be running the risk of you know, facing a potential compromise of their network and then the eventual compromise of proliferation to the device, whether it's the issue device or the BYOD device. And then they're continuing that exploitation onto the corporate network or even sensitive data. Um, so yes, yeah, so I would say it's better to provide the guideline, let them have it, deal with the operational help desk IT overhead uh, that may come along with it rather than just allow them to uh, quote unquote unsecure uh, their home networks. Absolutely. Thanks for answering that one, Blake. <clears throat> We're going to take one more question here. We'll, we'll take two more questions. We have a, an easy one here. Uh, this one is, is BitLocker adequate for hard disk encryption? Chris here, I can take that one. Yes, BitLocker is adequate for full disk encryption. BitLocker, as long as you're BitLockering the whole drive, is going to act as a full disk encryption and protect that local hard drive from offline attacks. So even with physical access to the device, without the BitLocker recovery key, without the BitLocker master password, I cannot access that machine. That being said, um, not to dive too deep into the weeds of how BitLocker works, if your end user's device has a TPM, a trusted platform module uh, chip on it, the BitLocker will be unlocked anytime the device is turned on. So if they still have the device, the BitLocker will be unlocked. However, assuming you're enterprise passwords are good enough to prevent a, a, a brute force attack against that, that device, the operating system can still be considered secure, but only as long as the passwords are secure. Back Absolutely. To you, yep, and I think, Chris, someone had a follow-up question to one that you had answered earlier. Uh, what is wrong with using RDP over VPN? I think that was kind of... Um, there's nothing wrong with using RDP over VPN. Um, uh, perhaps there was, a, there, there was a, a miscommunication on my part. Don't forward 3389 through the firewall. Um, don't expose remote desktop to the world. It's a big protocol. There have been a number of security vulnerabilities associated with it. And it's just, while there might not be an, an exploit right now, uh, there could be tomorrow. And um, it's, it's just a, a, a open hole that could potentially be easily exploitable. Um, using uh, a service that's had a lot more of a secure track record, such as SSH, would be uh, a, a bigger benefit. And with SSH, you can do port forwarding. You can you can forward 3389 to your end user using SSH. And with SSH, you can do things like issue um, RSA keys or ECD219 keys or whatever the newer one is uh, with passphrases attached. So the key's encrypted with a passphrase. And, there's multi-factor authentication built in right there. SSH is just way better of an option. Absolutely. Thanks for answering that. Well, look, we're going to close uh, the live question and answer. Uh, I'd like to mention that if any of the questions you submitted, uh, if, if we answered them, but you have more questions uh, or you want more information regarding those items, or if we didn't get a chance to get to your question and go over it, Feel free to reach out to us, any of us uh, here. Uh, we would be glad to have that conversation with you and, and get those questions answered. All right, that, that about wraps it up. The last thing I want to briefly mention uh, was we have put together over the past month a service called the Remote Access Assessment. Uh, we've developed it to assess all the key areas regarding 
remote workforce and access for any organization. So if you're interested in any information about that service, reach out to a member of our team here at Trace Security and we'd like to get you that information. All right, thanks everyone for joining the webinar. We appreciate all the comments, all the questions. And like I said, if you have any further questions that you'd like to have answered, reach out to our team or if you're interested in having some more information about the remote access assessment, uh, do the same. Thank you all for attending and have a great day and a great week.